Uh, hello and welcome to another episode of Bharat Work. I am your host Neeraj Kanodra, and with me I have Dr. Surjit Bhalla and Karan Basi. Uh, Dr. Bhalla is an Indian economist, author, and a columnist who is currently the executive director for India at the IMF in Washington D.C. He was also a part-time member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India. Karan Basi is a New York-based researcher with interest in macroeconomics, Indian political economy, and institutional economics. He has appeared on multiple episodes of Bharat Vartha previously, talking about his papers and findings in the economic field. So today we are here uh, talking about a paper uh, which they have. Uh, it's called Pandemic Poverty and Inequality and Evidence from India. And for the first time in research of any of its kind, the estimates include the in-kind effect of food subsidies on poverty. And it was found that extreme poverty in India was as low as one percent in 2019. Prior to the pandemic, and it remained at that level in 2020. It identifies uh, food transfers by Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana as one of the main reasons to keep poverty at such a low rate. So, <clears throat> I would like uh, moving on. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, there are a lot of government programs, right? There is Pradhan Mantri Ujjwala Yojana for LPG collections, Swachh Bharat Gramin Mission for building toilets, uh, Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana to construct houses. Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana to focus on social cultural development of villages and National Rural Livelihood Mission, right? So all of these, you all have like argued, the most important one is the food subsidy, and that has kept extreme poverty really low. So if I were to like just start off, tell us like about the paper you have uh, written a paper in the similar lines earlier. So what is the motivation to do the research, and what kind of uh, methodology uh, did you use? Where do you get the data from? Well, the motivation. to do the research came out of the bank world bank and at the fund india and china are very important countries and china recently announced recently meaning about 6 months ago or 9 months ago um they they had eliminated extreme poverty now as you know india and china are, are twins separated at birth and you know for a very long time india and china had the same per capita income from 1500 to 1980 and this is in in ppp dollars after 1980 china diverged from india and is today about two and a half times the per capita income level of india so it was i had dealt with this topic before uh, so this is not the first time i was looking at it but nevertheless it seemed appropriate given the policies that had been followed in india to reexamine uh, the issue of poverty decline in india and the measurement of extreme poverty so that was basically the motivation and to see how well did we compare with china's performance uh, so there is both a relative performance consideration which is important in its own right and perhaps even more important is the absolute determination of how well india has done for its poor there is talk about all the time about inclusive growth and inclusive growth is nothing more than the growth be shared in a somewhat greater proportion by the have nots than by the have so that was broadly uh, the motivation to examine the data to see where india stood in the hierarchy of nations for the alleviation of uh, extreme or the removal of extreme poverty the other question that i have so what is the key findings about like poverty numbers so i mentioned earlier that your uh, one was that extreme poverty uh, is below 1% so and you have like identified extreme poverty there are two definitions so 1.9 us dollars a day and 3.2 us dollars a day just give us a Think that what did you find, and if the data surprised you, or what is so unique that you found out? Yeah. Okay. Want to provide a perspective to the listener that poverty research, the first place in the world that research into absolute poverty, what is called now called extreme poverty, was India, way back in 1962, and in 64, the U.S. defined 
extreme poverty. And uh, that's when the food stamps program originated in the U.S. Extreme poverty is different than poverty. Extreme poverty is where what is needed for bare survival. And poverty is the bottom half or third or bottom quarter of the population in any country at any point. So that is uh, just to provide and, you know, we had a dollar a day poverty line. We had $1.08 a day poverty line. We had $1.25 a day extreme poverty line. And now we have $1.9 a day. You know, the funny thing is that they're all linked to and directly linked even though the World Bank may claim otherwise. But basically, because India had the largest amount of absolute poor, they, the World Bank defined its poverty line for the rest of the world based on the Indian poverty line. Okay, So this is very relevant for what we are discussing today and our finding. So the Indian poverty line is the benchmark for world poverty line for the last 45 years. The World Bank first came up with a poverty line uh, or estimate in 1974. Now, Karen and I have been working on, and Arvind have been working on the Indian economy over the last several years. And what we have noted in our other research is that Indian economy has done better than most, but almost never gets the credit for having done better than most. So that's an important consideration in our looking at this phenomenon. Then for a very long time, way back now to directly answer your question, that back in 19, late 1970s, India started the PDS program in your opening, which is the public distribution system of food grain. In your opening comments, you very correctly observe how in India, there have been several uh, directives uh, by the government towards the alleviation of poverty, toilets, housing, chulas, free gas, you name it. What we decided to look at was only one aspect of the entire phenomenon, which is the PDS aspect. Another important part of the PDS, which is important for our listeners to know, is that in 1985, when the PDS was about the only game in town in terms of government policy to alleviate a government program to alleviate poverty, that Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi observed that only 15% of the money meant for the poor actually reached the poor. And many people question, but serious scholars reached the determination that if anything, Rajiv Gandhi was an optimist. In other words, less than 15% of the monies meant for the poor actually reached the poor in 1985. And you can guess uh, what was happening, as Rajiv Gandhi himself guessed at what was happening, uh, is that there was a lot of corruption. So while we've had poverty program starting in the 1980s, throughout our history, and you know, the number one slogan of any government was, I begin in the name of the poor. So you want to do anything, you say you begin. You want to murder anybody, you say you begin in the name of the poor. Now, things have changed, and that is what is very remarkable about the post-2014 period, and which is, comes out very strongly in our findings, that the poverty decline post-2014 was much higher for a given unit of growth than ever before. This is because of several factors, but broadly, which have the following themes in common. One, technology, Aadhaar, and where is that little instrument? This little instrument. All of these, and if you will, the anti-corruption motivation, behavior of the government combine together to make the PDS a really effective instrument. I must confess over here, and I have written for several articles, including one for the bookings as recently as 2015, heavily criticizing the PDS program and the Narega program. 
I'm on record and in all sincerity, um, I concluded as recently as 2015-16 is that basically the system was manifestly very corrupt and not what What is remarkable and what comes out in our work is how, and you know, you've heard about it through one nation, one car. To think about it, we have been doing the PDS program from the late 1970s, 50 years. And therefore, and we have all this discussion about migrant workers, Every city has migrant workers from somewhere else, either as domestic help or as workers or as factory workers, you name it. So that means they can go out and get the PDS ration because you have to be in your own village where you register for you to get PDS ration. So I think it's these little attention, perhaps not small attention, or this major attention to detail and operation of the policy that the one nation, one card scheme came into place. And on top of that was the recognition of the pandemic that, listen, the pandemic is what it is doing is basically keeping people at home. And, you know, Karan and I have worked on this and on lockdowns, and we are not the biggest fans of lockdown, to put it mildly. Um, but nevertheless, that was government policy in India as well as the rest of the world. So first, you know, we are one of the very first countries to enter lockdowns, and that was end of March. And one of the very first countries to recognize that the lockdowns were not doing the job they were supposed to be doing. And I think it was a great error to ever think that lockdowns would work. But that's perhaps a matter for another day. The fact remains that by early July, India had given up on lockdowns and started economic activity allowing. Nevertheless, it was, it went on, different states had different policies and clearly the central government couldn't control that. Um, so I think it was dedicated to alleviate the hardship on the poor. And the poor in India, mind you, with the PDS program and all, is the bottom 50% of the urban India and bottom 75% of rural India. So we're not talking about 5-10% people. We're talking about 800 million people. So our study then looked at what had happened and came to the rather robust conclusion that what they had done was really a singular achievement, what the government had done. And that's what we have tried to document. Let me add a bit to this, uh, since you talked about motivation, you know, one of the remarkable things that we have noticed of lately, because this is, of course, not the first time that we have gone out and presented poverty estimates. We did it in 2019, immediately after the elections. And then, of course, there was a presentation at NCAER, which was, you know, the earlier version of this paper. The presentation was actually in 2020. Basically, we were discussing what happened to poverty between 2011 and 2017. And the reason why we got into this primarily, of course, Surjit sir has been involved in poverty computations. And it has been a area of more than passive interest for him over the years. Uh, but the reason we decided to get into this was predominantly what I call the bad equilibrium of research in this particular area. And I call it bad equilibrium because all the available evidence pointed at the prospect that poverty had come down. Yet, even before the 2017-18 consumption expenditure survey was released, Many had estimated that it had actually gone up. How did they have those estimates? We don't know. I mean, we are still figuring out how they came up with those estimates. We still don't know what went wrong with the 2017-18 survey, except for the fact that it is wrong. Its, it's conclusions are, of course, very problematic, deeply problematic for obvious reasons. And that actually got us into this business of, of trying to understand what actually happened. And if we are missing something that others are able to see, and if, if there's a blind potential blind spot, and after after a lot of work, even in 2020 itself, we realized that there's no truth to the endless estimates that were being floated around in, in op-ed pages, of course, because I think those who were sharing those estimates were also not convinced to put it in the form of a paper and put their name to it and, and put it out there. Incidentally, what then transpired was that with the pandemic, we saw some people rushing to put their name on a paper with sensational claims that poverty had gone up in India. I, I'm not going to take any names, but we do discuss some of that stuff um, in our paper. 
and at that point even at that point the conventional belief was that you know poverty between 2011 and 19 had gone up and and all sorts of that kind of analysis fast forward now when it was the end of april of 2022 and no matter who you listen to they all say that poverty actually went down between this period and i think it's it's incredible that if you look at what they were saying 2 years ago and compare it with what they're saying now there's no consistency yeah so, so that's why i said that it was a bad equilibrium that actually got us motivated to do this yeah i think there's like a lot of like me working outside the academia i kind of feel that there's a lot of echo chambers and it was fashionable at one point to say that uh, growth was unequal and like uh, money went only to the rich people and only the rich people were getting richer and we have so many unicorns but so many people going hungry so it was a little yeah. bit fashionable to say oh gini coefficient is rising or oh rich are getting richer but the poor are left behind right right uh, uh, depends on your ideology or depends on your uh, viewpoint you kind of always or maybe the people on the left always would say that you know so what what if this but they would say either like farmers are going to you side or people are going hungry i do agree to this so it's a great thing it's a great thing that you all have used data and you all have uh, actually done like detailed work to disprove these things which anecdotally so i'm based in singapore but my parents are based in india and anecdotally as you mentioned right it was known that uh, even in the heights of the pandemic people got their food so i want to come to this topic i think one very interesting part what you all have mentioned in the paper is that in the pds system uh, rice and wheat for the poor so if you have the below poverty line uh, ration card right which as you mentioned uh, 50% of urban and 75% of rural population has you got it at about 3 rupees a kilo when the prevailing market price is 30 rupees a kilo so even if you have like a lower income or an actual consumption is recorded is a little bit less one tenth on food your calorie consumption or your what you would call like your basic sustenance lifestyle is taken care of so it's a uh, very interesting to see that uh, you kind of point this out that you know what the real poverty is is probably like a lot lower than what conventional wisdom was and another thing uh, maybe you could shed light on was uh, you mentioned some extrapolation techniques used by previous world bank papers and uh, you said that they were flawed or inaccurate so just maybe you could like comment so one is on uh, how do you decipher between uh, people buying uh, grains at a cheaper price and how does that affect your poverty calculation as well as what was wrong with the world bank uh, techniques and what did you incorporate to reach the conclusions why don't you take this sujit sir and then i'll probably come towards the end if, if there's anything that just make you mean why were people behaving the way they did you know one point is people are very hesitant to admit that they are ideological all of us are ideological okay and we should admit we are ideological what i think differentiates a good researcher from a bad researcher a good analyst from a bad analyst is that you keep your ideology at home okay wo american express ka card hai na wo jo don't something don't go away with it or uh, whatever i'm forgetting it but you know ideology theek hai sab ke paas ideology hai and we should keep it at home or to ourselves when we analyze and the problem with and it, you know this is more the problem with indians than with anybody else that i know you know you'll never find a latin american or the chinese in particular questioning that their poverty is too low they will always uh, they they will never question whereas an indian god forbid you say poverty has gone down nahi nahi ye ho nahi sakta you know so it is aap bataiye you please explain what is it in our psyche that loves you know beating ourselves on the back for no reason i mean i don't know what jollies people get from stating the falsehoods in this case that in and it, it doesn't matter which political regime is in power okay i've been working as kevin said on poverty research since 1980 and i was at the world bank here there whatever and only the indians behaved in this bizarre fashion so i think it's for people like you to help explore and expose this tendency amongst indians you know we will pull down our own people 
uh, at the first opportunity. And no one else does that. So I think it's a combination of all of this with the result that ideology, and it's a way, I think, a perverted form of ideology that makes uh, us uh, not accept good news everywhere else. And one other point on this. In 2004, we increase the poverty line. The Tendulko poverty line is some 20% above the Lakhrawala poverty line, which was there before. And if you recall, in 2009-10, there was a big hangama that at that time, the hangama was, your poverty line is too low. Right? All the lefties it said, it said the poverty line is too low, it should be this, that. Now we are saying that and the lefty is saying, no, 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 poverty is not so low, so therefore the poverty line is not too low. Maybe, I don't understand it. So maybe Karan can explain. So uh, let me come to the World Bank paper since you specifically asked about that. Uh, yeah, you I know, mean, one thing... Avoided that... that but <laughs> yeah, I, I, I figured. Uh, I mean, one thing that uh, we kind of, you know, have been talking about a lot over the last couple of weeks, in fact, even before we went out uh, with this paper, is that there are several estimates that the World Bank has, you know, I mean, there's one estimate by Newhouse and Vyas for 2014. We match that with, with what we have. Then there's another one by Lachner et al. I think that's the one that they published just before, during the pandemic itself, reversal of fortune for 2017. We match that. There's another estimate by Adochi et al. for as recent as April 2022. This uh, sorry, February 2020-22. We match that as well. Now, there's one author in the February 2022 paper of this year who has another paper in April 2022 who disagrees with the World Bank paper of the February 2022. So now you tell me which estimate should we take at face value because there's one common author for both the papers in the same year with just one month apart with two different estimates. So, so that's one point that I think there's a lot of explanation that should be given on that front. And the second point is that the disagreement that we have is with the use of the uniform recall method. So consumption expenditure service have two kind of ways to do it. One is that you go and ask how much stuff that you bought, whether food, vegetables, consumer durables, etc. over the last 30 days. This is the uniform recall period. Now there's another one, which is the mix, uh, modified mixed recall period, which is seven days, 30 days and 365. So seven is for high frequency consumption items, 30 for relatively less. And then there's one year for consumer durables, etc. And across the world, what was found is that the MMRP method is more accurate accurate in terms of measuring consumption expenditure and it's no brainer it will be more accurate because poor people don't go buying microwaves televisions and cars every month yeah. so 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 that 73365 is a good uh, reasonable survey instrument and stood the test of time yes and most countries have that oh. now in india we of course adopted the modified mixed recall method as the default uh, method and the 2017 survey was conducted using just this method so there was no urb survey in 2017 uh, which of course uh, world bank acknowledges in a report and says that for further estimates of poverty they will be using the mmrp estimates which means that they would adjust it all the way back to as far as it's available. But none of these papers use the MMRP for, for their estimates. So they're still using the URP. And I think that's the source of the disagreement that we have. And, with and, and Kadan, a very important point along that. So they make this first error. And second, they don't account for food subsidies, which is right. for the poor, an important fraction of their right. total consumption. And therefore... Yeah, an important determinant about how low the poverty can be. Yes. Right. It's 14%. It's approximately 14% of the poverty line as of the pandemic year. And 14% is a lot. I mean, basically, it means that uh, it makes a big difference for those in and around that particular consumption level. It's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, so that's right. That is why it was quite heartening to see like you, you're like actually looking at a distinction that poor right. people are buying grains much cheaper. And right. one, more, one more finding I found. Let me. Let me add one point there. It's not just, just cheaper. They're getting it for cheap because of the 5 kgs. But a key point during the PMGKAY was to give 5 kgs of additional rice and wheat for free. Yes. And yes. 1 kg of pulses free of cost. So yes. 
so that i mean basically takes care of uh, most of the consumption needs because 10 kg is approximately what an indian household on an average consumes yeah you know, so i was going to come to that that uh, you all have checked the survey of population quintiles right o- obviously all of us are in the top quintile if not like the top 1 to 2% but even at the bottom quintile uh, you saw consumption of cereals was about 10 kg per person per month right and you are getting 5 kg at like 3 rupees a kilo and like 5 kg free plus like 1 kilo of pulses so your dal roti or uh, dal chawal was pretty much like very much free so your basic sustenance was taken care of even in the pandemic in lockdown where you did not have any work to do or you did not have a source so that's of an extra 400 rupees yes per person so that's you know a lot of money for the poor and that is why despite them not having income despite the pandemic despite the stay at home etc we we meaning the country was able the policy makers the government was able to keep the extreme poverty level as low as less than 1% i mean it's not why is this a mystery i don't understand we should acknowledge that this was a very good policy it worked it's another question how long should it continue so on and so forth and while we are on the question of how long should it continue there are two components to it as karan also just explained there is the 5 kg that is free that was added on in the pandemic year so the first question for policy makers and for all us us to decide is when is the time right to take out this free subsidy this 5 kg the other 5 kg comes from the national food security act of 2013 so that's a law a parliament law and for that to change whatever is required but there is a alternative and which we explore in the paper and mention and discuss and that is you know it may be more efficient welfare improvement if the poor were able to get this equivalent income or consumption rupees rather than uh in kind that's the big story in kind so the government has to look the operation of the msp is as follows apart from everything else the government gives incentives for farmers to produce the farmers produce then the government goes out and buys it from the farmers and puts it in go downs and in fed distribution free shops and then from the distribution free shop it goes ahead and you have a ration card and you get that from there so very you know wo hindustan mein ye kahte hain na ki naak aise nahi pakda ja aise bilkul directly pakad lo theek hai that's what we need to do so you know it's a policy decision that the government will have to take some time but it's worth considering we don't know now that the system is really working there are arguments for keeping but it also means that you have to have the msp in place which we have so we need to think was whether the policy that was there in 1978 which is close to 50 years ago is the same appropriate policy for today and i'm leaving that and we are leaving that as an open question for all of us to consider whether and when the time will come to change that policy yeah so actually i want to talk about that so there are a lot of uh, criticisms earlier that instead of giving people subsidized uh, food uh, have a cash transfer directly and say if somebody wants to consume more vegetables or more meat or more milk because there's this uh, paradox long ago in economics it uh, i read uh, the concept of giffen goods where you know poor people first they just consume bread this was in the west but as they get richer they consume less of bread and more of like other food items right so there is one question which is that and then the second one is uh, you correctly mentioned right your msp is kind of like about market clearing price at times right classic economics uh, price signal uh you grow too much of grains and possibly india does grow too much of cereals versus say edible oil or... and in punjab they shouldn't be growing it at all because right. of exactly. the water table yes so that is like a price distortion there 
and the other side is for consumption you are subsidizing cereals a lot more so what has happened is our diets are a lot more cereal based and i would say less vegetable or other proteins meat cereals so do you think as you mentioned like you kind of said that uh, some of these things should change i was in the camp earlier that just give cash directly because the leakage in the system are too much but after the pandemic it is not just question of having money in your bank account but having the pda store which gave you access to buying food or getting access the whole distribution network has worked quite well given that uh, everybody got it right so uh, what are your thoughts on like these two approaches like uh, subsidy versus cash transfer one other important thing you should add and it's implicit in what you were saying is that look taste change and also health considerations change you know it's a lot healthier to eat more vegetables and fruit than it is to eat bread or rice and again that's the point about development you know as you grow rich or less poor your taste change and we should now i i really i think the central part of our analysis of our message is to recognize that look we have changed we have developed we have improved and that the poor will always be with us so what do we suggest we suggest raise the poverty line okay mission is not accomplished maybe part one of the mission is accomplished but the poor will always be with us in any country at any time there are those at the bottom of the distribution and there are those at the top and it's a responsibility of those at the top with their taxes and their administration to provide for a reasonably minimum standard of living so that has changed so you know i don't understand i really do not understand why how anybody could be objecting and there are several people as khan says objecting to our research and whatever we are on the same page as everybody else we just looking at the data and saying this is what we should do we're not against providing incomes to the poor we're not against concerns matter of fact we are at the forefront of concerns for the poor this government has been at the forefront of concerns for the poor provided for them we just as economists and as social scientists we just looking for more efficient ways of doing things better that is what development is about and that is what we are concerned with sure. so another point i want to uh, make is india has like a lot of policy making it has ptsd from the time of like the 60s prior to the green revolution uh, that is why we have uh, a lot more uh, excess capacity at the food corporation of india which you can call probably leads to some dead weight losses uh, that much capital could be better employed as well uh, we saw that russia and ukraine war there's a whole realignment of uh, global food supply chains that egypt has accepted india as one of its wheat suppliers so now there's a bit of backlash that which says that oh we don't have enough food for uh, to feed our own population garibo ka kya as usual right how like i think your paper does a great job in highlighting that we have enough food and not only do we have enough food it is reaching the people as well right so <laughs> extreme poverty is less what do you think about kind of educating the population about uh, these things and how probably that the excess food stock we have uh, probably we could monetize it and uh, uh, improve our trade terms of trade for india yeah look <clears throat> do not underestimate to or realize or recognize that the questions that you're asking are precisely the questions that the government itself and policy makers are asking so they know and it'll be great error to think that they are not aware and this is precisely what i think policy will likely in evolve and the discussions will be on exactly these issues now the ukraine war has helped us but you know to think that oh if we didn't have the food corporation of india and we didn't have the msp we won't have i just don't think there's any basis for buying that just like you said earlier we should in some areas should be producing more wheat and more rice and some areas should be producing less wheat and less rice in particular for chaat so you know our attempt should be to maximize the welfare of individuals at a minimum cost 
Everything involves a cost and all we may be being a bit technocratic, but techno, technocrats with a soul. Yeah. I'm equally concerned about the distributional issues, about other aspects of existence besides food. But, you know, first, pehle pet puja, phir kaam duja. And, you know, and I really think that has been the guiding principle. And now, a pet ki puja ho gai hai, and at least there's a minimum amount of uh, food, maybe in some cases, an excess amount of food. And we need, as policymakers, we need to evolve towards uh, recognition that India is now a lower middle income country, is no longer a poor country. So just to just to add to that, I mean, the question of whether we should export or not, I mean, it's not independent of what we show here and the policy question that it throws up in the sense that first the, the decision should be that for how long will this additional food grain continue? Because that, of course, implies that there is a need for additional procurement. And the second question is that if it is not going to continue forever, then what is the relevant uh, buffer stock that the government has to maintain? And the reason why it's important is because over the last several years, procurement has been very robust. We have been well above buffer stock limits. And now there's another argument saying that, look, increase the buffer stock limits because if you don't, what happens if there's another pandemic 100 years down the line? <laughs> so... I mean, as if our population will just not, you know, kind of, it will keep on exploding and exploding and exploding. And all these considerations, unfortunately, you know, ignore a lot of complex forces that are at play. So I don't think that anyone who's making these judgments at the moment, because I've seen a couple of articles, uh, two or three of them lately, I think it's nice to think about it, write about it, talk about that, you know, we've had two good years of monsoon. So this year will not be a good monsoon because that's also one argument that someone gave. And I don't think policy making can be done on the basis of guess. And there is an element of probability and there's a, there's an element of forecasting, but you can't make forecast on the basis saying that last two years we had good monsoon so this year it's not going to be a good monsoon so we should be worried. I think another thing uh, you mentioned earlier Suji that uh, in 1985 Rajiv Gandhi mentioned that every rupee you spend only 15 pesa goes to the poor right. Now maybe I don't know what the leakages are but as I mentioned earlier there was also a problem that while grains were available for cheap not everybody had access to it. And now somewhere along the lines, what has happened is because sometimes price controls do that. You have subsidies, you have subsidized goods, but not everybody can access it. And somewhere along the last few years, this access has actually reached the final mile. So what do you think, what are the policies that the current administration has done or what has changed over the kind of nearly 40 years? And do is uh, these kind of social safety nets which are there. It's like a shock uh, absorber, if you were to call it, right? Do you have to say, this is looking only at PDS, but how these other shock absorbers or other of these social safety nets in the other schemes have also helped in alleviating uh, poverty or extreme poverty? Well, you know, I I think just, I mean, I, I'm trying to grapple with where you're getting and I, I think I have an understanding. It's a fair question. But as policymakers and as a government, you have to realize that the needs, because you've now achieved basic food security, health becomes a more important consideration for all. And this government has tried to anticipate that by making health insurance available to all. Another recognition is that education is very important and internationally, domestically, productively, wise, etc. Now that's available to all. Actually, we've done a, a really remarkable progress in education, but we now have a new problem. Or a problem of greater concern than ever before is the quality, I mean, and I'm talking independently of the pandemic, is the quality of education. So I think then it'll be quality of medicine. This is all very appropriate, very correct, and it's evolving. So all my plea, our plea, is to recognize that India is not the same as it was 75 years ago or 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. I'll give you one example of what I think all of us should begin to realize. First, everybody gets at least a high school education. 
I mean, the participation rate is upwards of, of the new crop is something like 90% will graduate. Then you have in college, there are more women in college than there are men. Pehle maada tha ke hum ladki unko nahi, beti bachao, beti padao. Wo kab tha? 2015. And now, just five years or seven years later, that is not... <laughs> That is no longer. And the last part about the Beti Bachao, recognize fertility. Are bhai, population is no longer the problem. The population growth rate in India today has been steadily declining. Is about 1%. Pehle 3% yes. Are, there were more mouths to feed, etc., etc. So the same amount of food that you produce now goes much further, can go for exports. So... You know, it is just that all of this comes from development. And I, all I'm saying, all that we are saying, recognize that India has developed in a remarkably inclusive growth manner. It is now achieved what many years ago or even 10 years ago we thought was beyond our reach. And now let's aim higher. That's all. It's, you know, the concerns are the same, but we now can provide better education, better health care, more vegetables and fruit rather than rice and wheat. Let me add to the point about that we have achieved what was probably deemed as impossible just 10 years back. And I keep coming back to this one video because I think it's very powerful. Uh, it's very powerful in its own right. This was a discussion on NDTV and you had a Nobel Prize winner in economics there with, of course, a fam very famous journalist and at that time a senior economic thinker. And the discussion was on electricity and the person from the government was talking about progress, considerable progress, which India had, of course, made since independence to that effect. But the point that was made by the economist was that, incidentally, both were economists, but the non-government economists was that less, uh, more than one third people of India did not have access to electricity. This was just maybe what, nine, uh, I think we re re uh, achieved yeah, that, ten years. that target in 2019. So in, within six years of that discussion, that's no longer a point of discussion. That's the scale of what we have achieved. Sanitation, again, a point was made that, you know, we don't have enough toilets. Uh, where we are today, where we are relative to... Water supply. Water supply. <laughs> Pipe water supply. And they said water supply. And, and now even that's going up. That's, I think, at 40... Last I checked, it was at 44% a couple of months back. I wouldn't be surprised if it's gone 50%. And the same figure in 2019 was 16% or 17%. So, I mean... Things are changing much faster and unfortunately those who used to talk about these issues earlier are no longer talking about them and it's, I would say that it's sad because these are really remarkable achievements, not just for India, but for, for any other developing economy which faces the similar kind of challenges that we face. There's a lot to learn from the Indian experience. And we have an entire we have an entire continent which is looking forward to such kind of development. So what we have learned here is applicable there. No, absolutely, absolutely. As in, uh, the whole thing about like what has happened is the efficiency of delivery of you say like goods and services. So agricultural goods or like uh, services or electricity, etc. It has a huge multiplier effect. So not just kind of at the bottom of the pyramid. So one is you're doing it from like a welfare perspective. But second is it increases productivity of everybody in the country, right? So then education, etc. So you have done a great job uh, at least communicating this. It's it's fantastic. I think a lot more people uh, should be uh, reading this. If not the whole 50 page paper or 54 pages paper like I did, uh, at least read the abstract. I have it out here. We put the link. So it is uh, Pandemic Poverty and Inequality, Evidence from India. Uh, April 2022, it's a working paper with the IMF. Uh, really glad. Thanks a lot for your time, uh, Dr. Bhalla and Karan. Yeah. Uh, the third author of the paper, Arvind Dhirwani, unfortunately couldn't make it uh, to this podcast. Thanks for this conversation. And uh, for the audience, yeah, please tune in to other episodes of Bharat Vartha. Uh, thank you and Jai Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bharat Vartha podcast. If you want to see more content like this, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We started Bharat Vartha to facilitate long-form discussions on politics, policy, and culture. We don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode. If you wish to offer us feedback, do reach out to us on social media. We are at Bharat Vartha on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
You could also get in touch with us on our website, www.bharatvarta.in. The links are in the description below. Until next time, stay safe, take care, and jai.